Thanks. I want a hug too. Thank you. All right. Hi, folks. All righty. There we go. So when I was young, I moved a lot. Three first grades, three third grades. You might have gathered I'm a bit of a math nerd, which is super cool in video game development, but not really helpful if you move all the time. It's a little tricky to make friends. But I hacked it. Especially if you're going to move every now and then, you can make friends the wrong way, which is being a little naughty about sharing your answers on tests. So this worked really well. I don't think my parents know about this. <laughs> until one teacher noticed that all the students around me were getting hundreds on their tests. And instead of assuming that Mike is gonna be a teacher someday, what a great mentor, instead, she gave us a pop quiz. And that pop quiz said, show your work. So it's really easy to cheat when you're copying an answer or memorizing an answer. But as we all know, if you really understand something, you can show your work. So this is kind of the gold standard for physics tests all over the world, but it's not the gold standard for artificial intelligence. AI systems are black boxes. And that is so, so dangerous, and I want to explain to you why. Kids understand more of what they're doing than the AI systems that have been just told, give me an answer. And that would be fine if the job of an AI system was to decide what cartoon to watch in the morning or which flavor of Pop-Tarts to have, but unfortunately, AI does a lot more than that. We use artificial intelligence systems to decide who gets parole and who stays in jail. In China, the social credit score system uses party affiliation and how much alcohol you buy to decide if you can travel on trains or get a business loan. Dating sites use AI not to get you the best match, but to make sure that you're paying a monthly payment and bringing your friends back to do the same thing. So imagine you're a six on the one to 10 scale of dating. So if the AI shows you a bunch of threes, you'll get frustrated. If it shows you a bunch of tens, you'll get frustrated because they'll never say yes. So it shows you sixes. 25% of the people in the United States are making genetic pairing decisions of what our next generation will be based on an AI whose job is to get money out of you. Plus, my wife's a nine and I never would have met her on one of these sites. So, <laughs> so that's you know, maybe a little silly, but autonomous vehicles, they're being fielded right now. I have a friend who rides to work every day in Detroit in a vehicle driven by black box artificial intelligence. So we're handing the keys to AI systems that can't tell us why they're doing what they're doing. So why not? I told you I was a math nerd. Give me a minute. We're going to put some slides up. So most AI systems are based on artificial neural networks. You have a neural network in your body from your brains down to your fingers. A neuron takes some inputs, puts an output, does some computation in the middle. So guess what? This is perfect for simulating in a computer. On the left, we have some inputs. What is that blob? In the middle, there's some thinking. Oh, that's pizza. Do I like pizza? Yeah, I like pizza. Am I hungry? Yes. And on the output, it's grab the pizza. But those systems get really, really complicated. 86 billion neurons in the human brain. No human can look at a network like this and understand why it does what it does. No computer can look at this and understand why it does what it does. And that would be just fine if we use these systems only for movie recommendations. But like I said, we use it for much more. And in fact, we're really sort of irresponsible when it comes to technology, right? This is radium water. So someone discovered radium and the properties and then said, let's throw it in water and serve it as a health drink for male virility. You can imagine how well that went, but it got a patent. Radium spray developed right here in North Carolina. <laughs> Radium spray, it's great for disinfecting your surfaces. Oh yeah, it kills flies. Oh yeah, sure does. Kills lice on your chickens. Hmm, is that a good idea? Kills the people who ate the chickens. This is part of the reason we have a food <laughs> and drug administration. It's, it's absolutely awful and that is what we do with super cool technology hammers. We start banging nails everywhere. And I'd love to say that this will be different but it is an arms race to see who can build the first trillion dollar search engine, who can build the best dating site. Elon Musk has said that the race for AI supremacy will be what starts World War III. Also, 
the head of Russia and the head of China have said that who controls AI will control the world. And these are the three cats you do not want to be in an arms race with, am I right? <laughs> so, some say it's winner take all. Whoever develops the best AI will build the best weapons, build the best next AI system. But I would posit it's more than that. I'm going to convince you today that AI is the race to build God. All right, that sounds pretty screwy. Everybody buckle up, trust me, you're gonna love it. Okay, so we want to build human intelligence in our AI systems, that's the goal. We want an assistant who will not just remind us of our anniversary, but will call the restaurant and make a reservation for us and make sure we get there on time. But while we build this general intelligence, an AI that can learn anything and do anything that we can, we will build super intelligence by mistake. Explain why. Imagine you build a cute little lovable AI. It's one year old, it doesn't know anything about the world, it learns by sticking things into its mouth or its computer sockets or whatever, go with me on this. So, a three year old AI will be two years away and maybe 17 years from then we'll have a fully human level, mature adult AI that can do anything we can do, right? No, because that AI doesn't sleep sort of like this three-year-old, I'm betting. <laughs> Building things, learning, touching the burner, it's hot, falling downstairs. But wait, this could be twins. We could make two at once and they could share. Or we could make 10,000 of them at once and they could share. And suddenly, instead of it being 17 years away from the day we first build a learning AI system, it's minutes or seconds. Before you even have time to tell your friends about it on Twitter, you've already built an 18-year-old AI. And then it's seconds after that before we have an Einsteinian AI. And then it's seconds after that that we have 10,000 IQ AI. Nobody knows what happens after that. So what could go wrong? Let me give you an example popularized by Nick Bostrom. We'll dress it up a bit. Your job is to build paper clips. You have a little <laughs> robot arm and some wire. And your job is to build as many paper clips as you can and nothing else matters. So the little AI bends paper clips, bends paper clips, gets to the end, has a stack of paper clips. Imagine that it had human level intelligence. Imagine it were you, and your job is to just build paper clips. You don't care about anything else. What would you do? Well, you might start by reading about paper clips. How are they made in factories? How do I smelt ore? What else can I make paper clips out of? Oh, there's wire in houses. Remember, you don't care about people or art or culture. Could I make paper clips out of plastic? Bone? That seems like a good idea. Let's raise the entire planet, gathering everything we can for paper clips. Oh shit, we're running out of planet. Okay, got an idea. We're gonna look up how to make rockets. We'll put paper clip making robots on the rockets. We'll launch them into space, and then they'll start consuming all of the other planets. <laughs> so this all sounds a little silly. Surely we're not really going to big build mega clippy. But it's just to give you an example of AI follows the rules you give it. It doesn't have any notion of ethics or morality or humanity. Nuclear war would cause a dark age where 5% of us are left living underground and uh, I guess 2,000 years later it's Planet of the Apes or something. I, I don't know how that works exactly. But there'd be something left of humanity. But if AI goes wrong, there's nothing left. And if you think that seems a little silly, surely well-meaning computer scientists like me would never make mistakes in a big old system. Oh. Wait a second, brilliant programmers make mistakes like this all the time. Operating systems have been around for 40 years and Microsoft has some of the best programmers on the planet working on a well understood problem. And AI is none of those things. Don't worry, we can control it, right? Uh, so imagine Dr. Fluffy Stuff here has me in a cage. He could keep me in a cage, right? He would put some, I don't know, some uh, squeaky toys and some Scooby snacks and I'd never get out, right? That's about as likely as it is for me to be able to keep super intelligent AI in a computer cage. I have no idea what it might do to try to escape from it, any more than he would understand that I would just disassemble the hinges of the cage. So we probably can't keep it in one place. And 90% of scientists think that we'll have human level AI by the end of the century. 50% of them think we'll have it in 20 years. So imagine what your life is like. You have human level AI that will do all the things you want done that you don't feel like doing. What am I having for breakfast? AI can solve it for you. What movie should I watch? It can do all of those things for you in 20 years. Okay, 
So we have 90% of the credible scientists with a clear reason why AI will be human level. And we don't all agree at all that once we have human level intelligence, we'll have super intelligence. That's a bit of a stretch. We're not all on board for that, but you can see why some of us think that might happen. So 90% of scientists think that a big irreversible change is going to happen to the human race and they're calling out for help. Does that sound familiar? It sure does. Climate change, everyone. And climate change has been a bear. And we should have listened 20 years ago and 10 years ago. And we're starting to listen now and it may be too late. And I think AI is the same sort of thing where we need to be paying attention right now to a massive uprising in the community saying, we're building too fast and we don't know what we're doing. So, surely I have an answer, right? Don't worry, we got this covered. All we have to do is build good AI. That's not hard. We just need to define what good is. So I'm hoping that after this session, we'll all get together and we'll agree on one definition of good. Okay, that might be tricky. Uh, maybe we'll ask the NSA to, no. Uh, how about the Dalai Lama? <laughs> Dalai Lama, the Raleigh Boys Choir, we'll bring them together and they will define <laughs> what good is. And that's, that's great for me, because then as a programmer, I'll build it. I'll build that AI directly to those rules that you've set. No tearing down museums, no turning people into paper clips, whatever else you come up with, and we'll nail it. It's just that we have to do it first, and first is really hard in the AI race. Because if Mega Clippy is first, or the North Koreans beat us to this problem, it might be too late. So what else could we do? Well, we could share our research. The OpenAI Foundation is trying exactly this. Let's assume that North Korea, or whoever the bad guy in your world is, Mega Clippy beats us to super intelligent AI. Hopefully, the good guys aren't far behind. The boys choir and Dalai Lama work together, code all night, and they come up with their solution a week later, and maybe it's soon enough. So imagine that it's 1944. You're working on the Manhattan Project. You haven't come to the end yet, and you're worried Hitler is going to beat you. And if Hitler gets the bomb first, he's gonna blow the snot out of the United States. Well, if you're really worried you're gonna come in second place, you know you'll lose. So one thing you could do, photocopy all your, well, mimeograph it or whatever you did in the 40s, but you take your research and you'd send it out on carrier pigeons or whatever they did back then and share it with the whole world. And that way, if Hitler wins, bombs the snot out of the US, the Belgian resistance can develop their own bomb and at least have a fighting chance of bringing democracy back to the planet. But imagine what the 50s would have been like. Would have been a bit of a mess if everybody knew how to do, misuse this kind of technology. So I don't love that answer. So answer three, become the machine. Seems a little crazy, we see this in movies on the, all the time, but we are building this technology right now. Brain-machine interfaces exist. The US military can help an amputee soldier by giving them a robot limb, and then they just think, move your hand, and the robot moves. So we're getting there and we're doing this. Most scientists think this will be too slow, but the benefit of being able to directly jack into the computers is we don't need the Dalai Lama team anymore to define what's good. We just plug it into ourselves and good becomes part of the system. So that's somewhat attractive. But I tell you, when my little girl was born and I was holding her in my arms and I was thinking a lot of things, but one was, what is she going to be like when she grows up? And I never thought, I hope I don't find out because I jack her into the matrix in time to join part of a collective hive organism like the Borg. No. <laughs> so is this retaining humanity? I don't think so. I don't love it, but it's an option. All right, so back to the first one, far better. Let's define goodness. We have our good team. We have our programming team that builds that AI precisely. The only way this is going to happen, and here's our chance right here, is understandable AI. We've got to be able to build an AI system and look inside and inspect it, see how it's following our rules and how it's not, how it's fooling us or whatever it might be, and then fix it. And then we'll keep repeating that process. AI that can show its work, explain how it came to the decision, we can improve it. And by the time we get to human level intelligence, ideally, we'll have learned how to build AI that actually does what we told it to do, as opposed to looks like it might be working. I'll leave you with a story. My father was a combat engineer. He paved Vietnam, and he's part of the reason I moved so much when I was young. So if you don't know what combat engineers do, it's, it's kind of like they're playing the Fortnite game, but in real life, because people are shooting at them and they're building cool shit like bridges. Okay, <laughs> so you get the idea. So these guys know what they're doing cold. 
They have a field manual that tells you, okay, the bridge is this wide, these are the materials you have, this is how heavy the vehicles are going to be, but they know this stuff. And the reason they know it is because at the end, they'll hop in a five-ton truck and drive across their three-ton rated bridge because they need to know that it works. Those guys show their work. So the problem we have here is we're doing the exact opposite of combat engineering. We're on the other side of this bridge is a potentially post-human age. But over there is the world's coolest video recommendation engine for YouTube, and the best search engines, and whatever else, and maybe rocket designs. They're all on the other side of that bridge. And we have no clue how to build bridges. But we're building it as fast as we can, and people are driving across it as fast as we can. And it just doesn't feel like the responsible approach to something that could have such a massive impact on humanity. So I would implore you then, don't be OK with it's a black box. Don't be okay with, it's making money this quarter and everything is going to be fine. We need AI that we can build, inspect, and improve. Because someday, AI might be building us, inspecting us, and improving us. And that is only if we're lucky. Thank you very much.